Um, I don't know, how many people watched the movie Griefwalker last night? Oh, great. Hey, that worked out pretty well, Stephen. Yeah, great. So um, I saw this movie, and I was really um, impressed with the different take on um, our issues and the, the way, the approach that Stephen takes towards our issues um, in moving forward the discussion and continuing the storytelling and the sharing that we um, have been trying to kind of talk about when we've been together at the conference these three days and about how important that storytelling and that sharing is as we move back into our own communities. So we invited him to come and speak um, today um, as a plenary and then also he's going to be doing a workshop right after this so that if you have questions or answers that you're seeking, um, you can do that in a more intimate setting along with that workshop. Um, after the plenary. But today he's going to spend some time with us. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, with, he, he uses counseling and ceremony. Um, for a quarter century he's been guiding individuals, couples, families, and communities through all of human sufferings, sorrows, and confusions in life. He has a master's degree from Harvard University in theology and the University of Toronto in social work. He's formerly a program director in a major Canadian hospital, an assistant professor in a prominent Canadian medical school, and an educator and advocate in helping professionals. Stevens consulted in palliative care and hospice organization and now teaches internationally. He's a woodsman, a sculptor, a traditional canoe builder, um, and who, whose house has won the Governor General's Award for Architecture. Stevens' work has been featured on international radio and television documentaries on care and, di and the dying and rites of passage. He's the author of several books, which he'll be signing actually after this session and after the workshop session. Um, and he is the subject of Grief Walker, which you saw last night, a National Film Board of Canada featured documentary. He's the founder of the Orphan Wisdom School, where he teaches something of the mandatory arts of living deeply and dying well. He lives beside an old river, which is something I'd really like to do someday. Live beside an old river under an old tree, that's my dream, um, in the Ottawa Valley of Ontario, Canada. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Stephen Jenkinson. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I can't see you, but I assume you're there. And uh, this is starting to feel like a game show all of a sudden, this cast of thousands. And Well, the first thing I want to do is make sure I, I lay the gratitude where it most properly belongs. Um, when I was first approached to come here, which seems like several years ago, but I don't think it was, uh, I was voted out, voted off the island of, of this conference. And um, well, we said, nice try, and then... All of a sudden, everything changed. I guess Mickey joined the group, and, uh, and then it was on again. Unfortunately, I was able to come. But, but uh, the gratitude I have is the bravery that the people who've put this thing together are displaying and asking me to come. I mean, it's not brave to ask me, but it is brave to have me, if I can put it that way. <laughs> and the reason I say that is, is a couple of reasons. First, um, uh, I'm not part of your organization. I actually don't know that much about it organizationally speaking, but probably thematically and culturally and spiritually, I probably have a lot in common with many of you. Uh, of course, you'll decide if that's true or not as the proceedings go on, but I suspect it might be so. But the other thing is, um, I'm, uh, I'm an outsider almost by uh, predilection, and it's not really my choice, but it always works out that way. And as such, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm reckless and careless with... Uh, with an opportunity that I've been afforded today. But it does mean I, I try to hit the mark as best as I know how, which often means that um, the preliminaries go by the wayside. And the age-old idea of somehow having to uh, build a relationship before you can risk anything is something I've never learned how to do too well, as you'll soon see. One of the things I learned at the deathbed, I was probably at 800 or 1,000 deathbeds during the course of my professional uh, ordeal. And um, one of the things you learn there is that um, dying people without being teachers can afford you the opportunity to unlearn a lot of crazy things that you had going in. 
One of them is the idea of the future. We trade on the future with some insane regularity, the idea that we'll, we'll have one, uh, that you'll have one and I'll have one, and so we can put off any number of vital, important things for a later date when we're more inclined, when we feel more ready, when our life is more amenable to uh, plowing the field of our discontent and so on. And then, you know, how many uh, appointments did I make with dying people only to discover that Tuesday at 3, they weren't there. It was over. And the last time I met them had already happened. And at some point along the line, I said to myself, that's it. I'm never going to proceed again as if there's tomorrow with these folks. And it becomes a bit of an occupational hazard that bleeds into your life. Before you know it, you're a real drag at parties because, <laughs> because you're proceeding like there's no tomorrow, which of course doesn't go well in social events. You know, you, you burn too hot too fast. You, uh, you, uh, you can't be easily thrown off the scent and so forth. So the other thing I should say by way of gratitude for this invitation is that I'm an outsider culturally and politically and citizenship-wise too, as you might have gathered from the intro. I'm a Canadian, and um, in that sense, what the, some of the things I'm going to have to say here now, they, of course, they derive from the clinical experience that I was lucky enough to have and endure for so many years. And almost all of that was in a large city in Canada, Toronto. Some of you have probably been. <clears throat> Excuse me. See, it is by almost any standard the most, quote, multicultural uh, city in the world. And uh, so it's from that that I dare to perhaps extrapolate from what I've seen to uh, imagine that this could be applicable to places that you work and live in. But I don't presume for a minute to say that everything I saw would automatically translate to an American context or an urban one or anything else. So I may slip in the occasional we or us uh, during the proceedings here, so forgive me if it doesn't look all that familiar to you. But the other reason it may not is because uh, it may not be the most welcome news and therefore seem foreign, but it may not be as foreign as it would at first blush sound. Okay, so proper to start with a story, and here goes. I'm teaching in a small town uh, close to where I live about a year and a half ago. And as is true of this audience as well, uh, the audience that day was uh, just about universally the same skin tone as my own is. And I don't know why it is that this, um, that palliative care generally uh, seems to draw heavily on the white population to the exclusion of most other folks, but that's the way it seems to go. And so there was one exception as she sat at the back the whole, the whole morning and then the whole afternoon. And when we were done, uh, people were, you know, wanted to speak and, and talk and sometimes argue and fight and, um, you know, cast aspersion and so forth. And so I'm happy to do that because I can cast aspersion with the best of them. And, but I saw this woman sitting in the back and you could tell that she was waiting for her opportunity and she'd already decided that the opportunity uh, was um, unimaginable if there were any witnesses. That means it had only to be me. So I thought, well, it's usually in a situation like that, it must be intensely personal in some fashion, and, and so fair enough. So finally, everyone was gone but she and I, and then she came forward very um, sheepishly, and uh, we shook hands, and, and then uh, she, she cut right to it, and this is what she said. She said, um, you know, until this morning, I've been doing something with great regularity on the palliative care unit that I work in. In fact, I've done it every day, I think. We have a thing that we call uh, intake. I said, oh, yeah, I've, I've heard of that. My sympathies, I hope you're going to be okay with that and get through it, you know. Eventually, they won't have that anymore. And she said, and we have an intake form, God help us. I said, oh, yeah, that's, that's, those are rough. And you have probably check boxes, don't you? Oh, we have check boxes, yeah. And no elaboration, right? Because who needs elaboration when you're intaking someone who's dying, right? Right, okay. I know the routine. And she said, well, we have one box in there that says cultural issues. And the, the uh, choices you have there are yes or no. <laughs> so I, I nodded. <laughs> and she said, well, she said, what I've done since, since I started working is every time the patient and the family were white, like you, I automatically checked no. That's astounding. 
if you're willing to think deeply the consequences. First of all, how does she learn that when it comes to the dominant culture in North America, there are no, quote, cultural issues? That the cultural issues, quote unquote, are purely the consequence of having people of different skin tone or cultural persuasion present. And when they're not, when the outsider, when the minority person is not there, then magically there are no cultural issues. But she did learn it. And you could say, well, she wasn't, she wasn't well trained. And I would disagree with you. She was very well trained regarding a certain kind of strange prejudice that seems to pervade. And she learned her lesson well. And she had to probably turn her back on some intuitive sense that it wasn't quite that way and eventually had to go along with the status quo and the norm that says when it comes to the dominant culture in North America, there are no cultural issues. And when does culture show up typically in the care of dying people? In my experience, the answer is when you have a difference between people who are providing the service culturally or racially and the people who are on the receiving end of the service. That's when it comes up, but at no other time. The reason I tell you that story is to say that I think the thing that continues to be missing in the care of dying people over and over and over again is the willingness to know that most people come to their dying time informed by a whole sequence of associations and uh, intuitions and fears and traumas and not one of them did they choose. Not one of them did they come to voluntarily, willingly, knowingly, intentionally. Instead, every one of those things was inherited. <clears throat> Even the things that they fear most about their dying time, they're culturally driven. Fundamentally, they're not psychological realities. They're cultural realities. And the great uh, misfortune that now befalls most dying people in my experience is just when we've decided that the quote quote unquote religious approach to dying is perhaps um, had its day and perhaps that's a good thing what we've done is replaced a general a generic religious orientation with a generic psychological orientation instead and I submit to you that the, that the, the dire consequence of doing so is that we've decided that every dying person is dying according to their own personal style. And then most of the treatment for dying people caters to that style and insists that that style be enthroned as the principal determinant for how the dying is, quote, managed. That's what I saw over and over again. Is it, did I say that too fast, or are you with me on what I just said there? Okay, this is, a, this is the audience participation part of the event. Uh, yeah, see, I'm speaking really plain English, but, but the concept is so plain, it's actually under the radar, not over it. Okay, so I'll try it again. If you don't get something, you say, what? That'd be good. So, something like this. As long as you approach dying people and their dilemmas, their, and their families, of course, and their dilemmas, challenges, their angers, their frustrations, their huge terrors, as long as you approach those things as if they're a psychodynamic reality, meaning that somehow these arise from our early childhood experience or old associations or all other deaths that they saw and so on, if you approach it that way, then your whole counseling regime is determined by a generic psychological approach to people that has, listen to me now, that has nothing to do with dying at all. So I want to say that again. People who are psychologically trained in the so-called psychological arts, none of that training is dying specific. Okay? All psychological practitioners believe that the psychology they've been trained in applies without hesitation to dying people equally as it applies to all other elements of the population. There's no, th there's no thought otherwise, my experience. And what I'm, what I'm asking you to consider is this. Dying people do not die by choice. Their way of dying is not a thing that they choose.
their way of dying, all of the intuitive reactions they have to it. Every one of those things is culturally driven and culturally derived, which means that the only sane or the only sanity-making response that I think makes any sense in working with dying people is to come to the whole enterprise culturally, which means if you want to change something, and I do, lots of things, then you have to, your, your lens and your thrust has to be at the level of culture, not at the level of individual psyche. That's what I'm asking you to consider. That's the kind of overture to what I have to say this morning. So, I'm going to proceed without making too much of a case for it right now, that the, the culture that, that, is, that I'm a product of, and perhaps you are too, is fundamentally, irretrievably, irredeemably, and for the foreseeable future, entirely a death-phobic culture. Okay. Until, until we're, we're willing to wrestle that one to the ground one way or another, every, everything else we have to say is floating in the air. It's not rooted in any deep take on things. That's mine, that the culture is fundamentally death-phobic. And I said irretrievably, which means it's not changing. And it won't change. And it's probably the fundamental reason at least two-thirds of you are sitting in this room. Whatever your personal motivations are, the deeper reason is because your personal motivations have run headlong into the prominent death phobia of the culture, and the death phobia was not giving in, and didn't, and won't. Why not? Because the fix is in, that's why. Because like all miseries that are chronic, Death phobia works. I'm going to stop for a second so that can um, have its way with you, that proposition. Death phobia works. It means what? It doesn't do anybody any good. I didn't say it did anybody any good. I said it works. How does it work? It works really well, actually. Here's how it works. You know the word phobos is a Greek word meaning fear. So <clears throat> the fear of death is rarely appears as a fear. Yeah, that's the first uh, remarkable agility that death phobia has to survive all comers, all challenges. Because it, it rarely looks fearful. More often than not, it looks intelligent. It looks well informed. It looks prepared. That's how it escapes notice. It looks competent, death phobia. It's, um, death phobia looks like this. Uh, the language where I live is uh, advanced directives. Do you have that phrase here? You understand what the concept is anyway. Yeah, that's a good example. Uh-oh, just lost seven people. Wait a minute. I write, I write advanced directives for a living. Well, okay, you might want to consider getting other work, is what I'm saying. Why so? Because de uh, advanced uh, directives are written by people who ain't been there yet. That means they're fantasies. You see what I'm saying? That means, for example, typically they're driven by the idea of what enough already is going to look like. Are they not? That's really what they are. They're scripts for what to do when we hit enough already land. And then lo and behold, what happens easily 85% of the time is that enough already doesn't resemble at all what you thought it would when you were writing the advanced directive, okay? And all of a sudden, you're certainly second-guessing your own judgment about whether what, at what point life is no longer worth living. And more, most often, when we're anticipating in the early going, the question often comes down to who wipes who. You don't find that at all funny. But you should find that funny because it's ludicrous to use this as a measure of whether your life's worth doing any longer. But in the early going, many, many people use that as the Rubicon, as the decision maker, as the realize, oh no, that's it, man. When I can't be in the bathroom by myself, that's it, it's over. And so, and why would that be? Well, in a culture that puts insane significance upon toilet training, Do I make this up? I don't make it up. This is what I'm talking about, about culture. 
So it's no wonder that when you can't be in the bathroom and you're on, you decide, finished. Yeah. So you say, well, you're making a joke. I'm not making a joke. I'm observing something. This, this is what I saw over and over again. So anyway, you get there, of course, and you find you're not in the bathroom alone. And although it's every bit is undignified and horrendous as you imagined it to be, it still doesn't look like the end of the road, which is kind of what you were hoping, that the end of the road would have a sign on it that said, enough already. You've done your best, pal. Hang it up. And it almost never does. Hmm? So you get there, and now not only are you uncertain about where you are in the arc of your life, but everybody who's being paid or by family association is obliged to be there is also suddenly playing 52 pickup with the situation. Nobody knows where they are. This is death phobia working. That's what those things are. There's death phobia working. Well, it's easy to make the case that the culture is death phobic. And I don't have too many people I can feel that are, that are really aggrieved by the thought that this is so. Or at least object to it. But the second, the corollary of this is, I think, a much harder sell. And it's the thing I'm going to be talking about after the break. Which is, if the culture is death phobic, it's m many more times grief illiterate. That's my phrase to describe what I'm talking about. You say, why would you call it illiterate, grief illiterate of all things? It's because I'm, I'm implying by that phrase that grief is something that has to be learned. That it's not intuitive. That it's not inevitable, especially that one. That it actually has to be practiced. And it has to be learned because you're not born knowing how to do it. And if you're going to learn it, that means you have to have teachers. And therein lies the rub. Because how many grief teachers is this culture willing to tolerate? My experience, not many. Maybe none. You're the one who's the drag at the party. If you propose to be a grief teacher. You, know? you say, well, what about all the grief counselors? I say, yeah, I know. They're not teaching grief. I'm making a general observation. Okay, there are exceptions. Of course there are. But it, sadly, they proved the rule. Grief counselors do not teach grief. They teach what to do about grief. They are the people who string the log boom around the oil spill of your grief and teach you how to contain it so that it doesn't mess with your entire existence as if it's not supposed to. Where was that written down? That grief is, has the best before date on it. And it's not supposed to bleed into every aspect of your life. The answer is, it's certainly written down in the DSM, was it five now? Or? I'm, I'm losing track. It's been a long time since I looked at it. Five's coming up, and they still haven't sorted it out. You think about it. They got five editions of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, five times trying to get it right. And they still ain't got it right. I mean, if your holy book went through five editions and they're still trying to work out the bugs... <laughs> Think about it. Would you, you'd finally say, okay, call me when you figure it out, okay? Here's my membership card, or so forth. So grief illiteracy is by far and away the worst dilemma. Death phobia can be contended with. But with what? With what skill? With what kind of emotional competence are we going to be able to contend with <clears throat> Excuse me, the utter refusal to die when it's your turn? And the answer is, you have to come to it with a, with a kind of moral intelligence that's infused by grief. And after the break, I'll talk what I mean about, you know, grief. But that's a, as a proposition, that's what I'm asking you to consider, that grief is an intelligence. It's not the end of your intelligence. It's its beginning. That's where it's actually born. Your capacity, in other words, to be a deep-running human being is born in your capacity to grieve on schedule, or as I put it, to be wrecked on schedule. You see? Okay. So in my experience professionally, and of course personally, because I've been around longer than I've been professional, thankfully, and I've survived the professionalism, and here I stand, living example that it is doable, although I don't advise, you know, going through the slings and arrows to find out. But <clears throat> one of the things I realized in the, in the death trade, which is what I call it, and I think that's a fair characterization of what it is, 
is that there was an old nightmare that most palliative care was tweaked and designed to contend with and to slay. And by and large, it's been enormously successful in North America in doing exactly that. And here's what it was. In your grandparents' generation, still, so it's not that long ago, the great boogeyman that was around <coughs> was that people would die fairly unexpectedly. He said, that doesn't sound that awful to me. You know why? Because it doesn't happen that often now. That's why it doesn't sound so awful to you. So you must imagine that culturally speaking, what you have <clears throat> as we came into the 20th century is this growing, um, hugely persuasive idea that we can fix anything eventually. If we throw enough money, enough R&D, enough fill in the blank, things are going to get sorted out. And the things that used to uh, bedevil our, uh, our peace of mind will eventually succumb. That's, you've lived your whole life with that belief. You've swum in that ocean, as have I. So obviously then, dying in a random and unexpected fashion would be close to the very height of what's no longer tolerable or dignified behavior in a culture that believes inherently in its ability to fix everything. Okay, you with me, what I'm saying? All right, that's the old nightmare then, to die unexpectedly. And by and large, I'm not talking about accidental death now, obviously, I'm talking about anything that's, that has a medical element to it, right? That has some time lapse to it. <clears throat> What's happened, certainly in the last 60 years, is the technology has improved so much diagnostically and secondarily, uh, interventionally, that people, by and large, do not die unexpectedly anymore. And to that extent, we have been enormously victorious, which, of course, should mean if there are no unexpected deaths anymore, or few, then if that was the cause of the lion's share of the grief, suffering, sorrow, and mayhem in the old days, we must be doing a lot better. So the question before you, of course, is how's it working so far to have managed, predictable, inter intervention, amenable dying, which is the norm? Nobody wants to take that one on. I know nobody's jumping up to answer the question, how's it working so far? Maybe the fact that this conference is happening is an answer to how's it working so far. It's not turning out as we imagined. Why not? Because the old nightmare has actually been eclipsed by a totally unsuspected new nightmare. And the new nightmare is a consequence of the solution that we crafted for the old one. And what would that be? So the person has been uh, diagnosed, hopefully, quote, in the early stages, unquote. <clears throat> And the stats are that 50%, depending on the location and the nature of, let's say, cancer right now, 50% of those folks will not die of that cancer. So that's the statistic people love to talk about. And I always say, but my constituency is the other 50%. How come we don't want to, how come they're not the victory stories that everybody wants to talk about? Well, we know the answer why, because there's more death phobia here. So what about them? Yet, yeah, those folks will die of the disease that they've been diagnosed with. Okay. But there's many things we can do to forestay that and forestall it. And we do. And we do have the technology. Those of you who saw the film last night saw some examples of it inflicted on a 20-month-old child who was not allowed to die when it was her turn to die. And that's how compassion is inflected in a death-phobic culture. I say it again, people who are dying, who at some point finally are trying to die, when you're dying in a death phobic culture, you will be on the receiving end of a compassion that obliges you not to die. Which raises the question how compassionate that really is. So the old nightmare has given way to a new one. What would the new one possibly be? The answer is, 
you've, you've subjected yourself to the rounds of chemo or whatever else was offered, and you know, pro probably properly so. And the consequence was what? Automatically. You remember the prayer that you were making for the wish or the hope you had for more time? Done. Almost universally, depending on where you live in North America and how willing you are to, be, uh, to cooperate with the treatment regime, you will at some point enjoy the remarkable and varied benefits of more time. I don't know if you've ever thought that thought, but the truth of the matter is everybody that I worked with in palliative care was in the midst of the more time they had hoped for. And I don't know, there, there was 5% of those people who ever imagined that that was so. They were still waiting to find out if the more time had kicked in. They were still waiting to be told. You see, But the, the fact that I was standing there talking to them was proof that it had already taken place because minus the treatment, they wouldn't be standing there talking to me. And lo and behold, then, the more time bears no resemblance to what the fantasy suggests that it should at all. More time means inevitably more what? More symptoms. More drugs for the symptoms and for the side effects of the first drugs. And I won't go down the list. You know, I'm sure, in your way as I know it in mine, that more time bears no resemblance to what we bargained for. And that is the nightmare I'm talking about. And it's the most benign nightmare compared to the first one. It doesn't look all that bad, actually. You mean, you're telling me that the new nightmare of my dying time is that I have more time? Is that what you're saying? That is what I'm saying. The new nightmare, though, has a particular inflection. It goes like this. The old one was, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to die. And the new one is, I'm afraid I'm not. The old one was, I'm afraid I'm going to die unexpectedly. And the new one is, instead of an unexpected death, what you're going to hear from me when my time comes is an unexpected wish to die. Unexpected how? Here's how. Most of the requests that I got to help people kill themselves, which was very frequent in my time, it happened at least every two weeks, those requests came not at the time you might have imagined they come. They didn't come when the, the side effects were horrendous, as they can oftentimes be. But that, usually, that wasn't usually the time I was asked to help. It rarely came when the symptoms were, you know, raging and so forth, probably scenes that you've seen and I've seen many times. Do you know when the request came? When nothing much was happening at all. How mysterious. Because I know that the system that I worked in was counting on the fact that the symptoms would drag all of us eventually to a kind of wisdom about what choices we were going to make about treatment and so forth. We counted on it. We counted on the fact that we would know what enough already looked like. But we've lived this kind of in-between twilight existence called being in palliation to the point where it's unendurable to continue. And yet, to not continue seems equally unendurable. And that's the new nightmare. And it's what they call in trade an iatrogenic nightmare. For those of you not familiar with the word, iatrogenic means a malady that's inadvertently caused by a cure. I'm not blaming anybody for the situation I'm describing to you. I'm telling you, I think it's an inevitable consequence of failing to tackle the death phobia first. Sorry, is that making noise when I do that? Okay. Hey, this podium's throwing me off. But. So I'll say that again. Until we were willing, are willing to tackle the death phobia for what it is and try to, a cameraman saying, could you not move around? I just saw him move the camera. Okay, I'll stay right here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Normally, I'm all over the place, man. I'm buckling under for you. <laughs> this is so you can see. The rest of you are missing the delicious qualities of this that the people in the front row are getting. So you, that's why I'm staying still. 
Yeah, um, <clears throat> you see, palliative care has become, I think, almost by as this kind of sin of omission, a customer satisfaction enterprise. Meaning what? Well, meaning that the basic program is to, quote, give the people what they want. You say, well, that never happens because nobody wants to die like that. And I'm going to beg to differ with you. I'm not saying that people do want to die in the miserable way that I've just described. I am saying, however, that by virtue of um, a failure to choose, many, many people I worked with did die in that kind of state with a low-grade terror that their really competent pain management didn't even touch. So how to account for this? I'm suggesting to you that it's because the death phobia never was challenged in the first place. Where do you expect it to show up, death phobia, at the, quote, end of life? And the answer I would give would be right there. That's where you'd expect to find it. Oh, well, but we wouldn't expect to find it in, uh, in palliative care where people are paid to... Oh, no, I would expect to find it there. Well, then you wouldn't expect to find it among the families of the people who are... Yes, I would expect to find it. Where do you think the culture lives? That's where it lives. And, well, you wouldn't expect to find it in a conference like this, would you? And my answer would be, in, in proportionate numbers? Yes, I would. Of course I would. But, you know, I bring you back to the observation I made earlier, which is death phobia is not what it, you imagine it to be when it's actually showing up. And death phobia principally would be, when it's my turn to die, I'm going to invoke every alternative to that regime that I can. That's what it looks like. Are you saying nobody should uh, take chemo? No, I'm not, I'm not, there's no should in this. There's a greater dilemma than should or shouldn't. And that is, if, you're, if you are insistent that things have to change, as I am, and if you're insistent that there's a kind of madness that's masquerading as a professional compassion in this culture, and I am certainly saying that, then you have to begin in the cradle of what creates it. And the cradle that creates it is the death phobia that is never asked to pay the rent, that is always catered to whenever it shows up. So when dying people refuse to die, we say, no problem. We have the technology. You don't want to die now? Don't have to. And, you know, I'm not making that up, obviously. The characterization might seem a little stark. But the truth of it is right there. So, you know, I can feel there's a lot of tension now in the room about this because are you saying now that uh, somehow that people should, should just, uh, like, fall off the edge of the known world when they get a terminal diagnosis? No, I'm not saying that. Well, what are you saying? I've already said what I'm saying. You can't translate what I'm saying into marching orders, friends, okay? Because that's more of the same. I called grief a moral intelligence. You're now hearing what I mean by that. That the greater challenge here is not to mobilize to, to, until we figure out who the bad guys are and then demonize the bad guys or the bad ways and include ourselves among the righteous and the saved. That's what I'm asking you to consider. For example, what? Well. You're familiar with this phrase, uh, quality of life, surely. I mean, people are making a fortune and a killing off this industry called quality of life. And I have yet to hear anybody come up with a quality of death uh, scale. Maybe it's out there, but I doubt it. Why not? Why are dying people held to a standard of life that's called quality of life, I ask you? Why is that? And if you look at these quality of life indicators, read the scales, friends. Just look at it. Don't take it from me. I'm just a sheep farmer from Canada. so I don't know nothing about it, but maybe. But here's what I'm asking you to consider. When you read the literature, what you will discover is that there are two... Hey, Mickey, where are you? You here? You ducked out. Okay, well, Mickey told me that the time was going to show up on this thing here, and it's black. So at some point, I'm going to ask somebody what time it is. Like now, what time is it? Thank you very much. I'm supposed to stop at 9.30, right? Okay. All right. Sorry for the break in the action there. Uh, what was I saying? 
I thank you very much. Yeah. So you read the literature, and one of the things you'll discover from this is that there are two themes that show up over and over again in our insistence that dying people should enjoy X quality of life. And here's what the themes are. One, that dying people should enjoy a high degree, even though perhaps on the downward descent, but a high degree of autonomy. And the second one, which is closely related, is that dying people should enjoy a high degree of competence in all matters. No caveats, no limitations on that ex experience, that um, expectation, none. What I'm asking you to consider is this. When you hold dying people to a standard like that, you're holding them to a, a quote, quality of life they have not enjoyed since they were 14 years old. Yeah, 14 years old was the time, for those of you who, for whom it's been a while, 14 years old was the time when you were completely competent and completely autonomous. Of course, neither one of these things were true, but if you were asked, you would have said you were, right? I don't need you, but except for the, can I borrow the keys though for the, I don't need you, but the car and so on, like that. So my point in raising this is to say what standard are we holding dying people to and calling it quality of life? And the answer is, it's a standard that completely resists the realities of dying. Completely. In fact, that's what it's designed to do. To keep the realities of dying at bay as long as is technologically possible so that you can enjoy the relative and iffy benefits of more time. And you say, well, those damn doctors, I knew that. Wait a minute. It's very hard to do that to somebody who doesn't want it done to them. I'm saying that when you've turned the care of dying people into the customer satisfaction business, you're asking for the situation I've just described to you. What you're asking, what, what you're doing is deferring to dying people and saying, hey, by virtue of your terminal diagnosis, you have a wisdom that you didn't heretofore enjoy. That means you will know what's good for you, and we will deliver on what you ask for. That's what goes on every day in that business. You know what that's called, friends? Patient-centered care. That's what it's called. And I ask you this, I understand the motivation for putting the dying person in the center of the care plan. I'm just asking you, what's the consequence of doing so? Not the intent, the consequence. And I submit to you this. Well, I should rather ask you a question. We understand in that model that when the doctor sits at the table, why the doctor's there by virtue of experience and training, hopefully, and, you know, position and so forth. And how about the family members? So we know why they're there, because they're family members. And so, and so that's their competence, such as it is, I should say. And how about the dying person? How did they get there at the center of this circus? What's the competence they bring that is automatically assumed by putting them in the center of everything? Is there really any serious wisdom that comes inevitably from receiving a terminal diagnosis. I submit to you, there isn't. There isn't. It doesn't make things clearer. It doesn't help you know. They made a movie. You know the movie, you've probably used the phrase, it's turning up in the language now. What movie am I thinking of? It's called Bucket List. Okay, that's the whole theme of that film. That's why it was so popular. What's the theme of the film? When you find out that you're going to die, you will finally do all the righteous, life-loving things that you weren't doing when you were capable of doing them. That's the conceit of that film. It's lunacy. It's not my experience that dying people suddenly know something they didn't know before as a consequence of finding out that they're dying. And yet, we enthrone dying people as the people who should be calling the shots. And what's the 
what's the prior experience they bring to this esteemed position they suddenly hold? And the answer is nothing. There's no experience in life that, that equips them to suddenly be in this position of making these enormous decisions. It's a very troubling thing. It's a very troubling thing. So I submit to you that this quality of life mania that we're inflicting on dying people and their families is actually serving the death phobia. It doesn't challenge it. It doesn't keep it at bay. It's exactly the thing I'm talking about. And I would rather call it, instead of quality of life, I would call it competence addiction. That's what it fundamentally is. So we refuse in this dominant culture of North America to be anything less than utterly competent all the time. And so what does competence in dying actually look like? And the answer is, you can't tell if they're dying or not. Do you see what I'm saying by this? You don't see what I'm saying? Hmm, mysterious. Okay, I'll try it again. The idea of competence, and I put the word addiction beside it, and instantly in your mind, then that makes no sense as a phrase. Because competence in and of itself is supposed to be a good thing, right? It's supposed to be a helpful thing, it's supposed to be good for you and for the people around you. But I propose to you that in a death phobic culture, like the one I've worked in all, all my life, competence is an addiction. It's deeply intolerant. I mean, if you're over about 63 or 4 years old, friends, I'm telling you something you've already lived. Am I not? You know it very well. You know why we have old folks' homes and so on. It's not, we don't have old folks' homes because we believe in the inherent majesty and honor of the aged among us. Come on now, that's not why they're there. Any more than we have a lot of cancer, cancer treatment facilities because we believe in cancer. No. And so by the same token, the reason that age is not honored among us is because there's nothing competent about it. It's diminishing competence. And what's the word that they use psychologically when somebody asks in a palliative care unit for somebody to help them kill themselves? And the first thing we do is submit them to what kind of test? A competency test. I'm not making the word up. That's the one that's used. That's the addiction I'm talking about. But the truth is that dying people, their competence is dying at the same rate as the rest of them is, as it should. So what kind of quality of life scale are we going to have where all our abilities are in the proper downward spiral? And that's honored. When is that going to happen? I don't see it yet. And I worked in this trade a long time. And I don't see anybody saying, help me be un... Uh, what was the word? Competent. Yeah, help me be incompetent. Help me learn incompetence, finally. I think it's my turn. I'm so tired of competence. Leonard Cohen, who's, a, who's one of my countrymen, even though you stole him, but the only reason you stole him is because we didn't take care of him, so fair enough, you know. But he's got a line in, uh, he's, he's got a new record out, and some of you may know it's called Old Ideas. And it's, all the songs are about getting old. And they're fabulous, man. And one of them, he says, he says, um, I'm tired of choosing desire. I've been saved by a blessed fatigue. The gates of commitment unwired and no one trying to leave. It's gorgeous beyond belief. And one of the things it's saying is, guess what? I've made my stock and trade out of desire, which he has. And at his age, He's willing to know another thing about it, which is you can be saved from desire, okay? But it doesn't turn into a bag of sawdust. It means your capacity at being old, righteously and properly old, is that you no longer are driven by what you want, but instead you're willing somehow to serve to be a faithful witness to what it is for those things to diminish. What, what is dying but an accelerated experience of the same thing? I submit to you, I think it is. 
Oh, have I was told, but I was told I should stop early because you have to check out. That's what I was told. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I was told. You know. Don't get me started, man. I ain't started yet. I'm just, I'm keeping it in low gear because, you know, I do this three or four days at a time, friends. In my school, I do this three or four days at a time. Eight, nine hours a day, 12. Like this. So it's very hard to rein this in for 50 or 60 minutes. And my apologies to you. You know, I'm doing my best not to go too far, too fast in any one direction. But just give us some things to wonder about, which in an hour is all we can really do. Is be willing to wonder about something that looks so certain an hour before. That's all. Okay. A little etymology lesson would be in order right about now. And that's the etymology of the... Uh, everybody know what etymology means? Uh, etymology means the deep story of what that word has meant and why it no longer means what it once meant and what does that mean? Is more or less <laughs> what etymology is. It's one of my favorite books. Etymology, a regular dictionary is where good, perfectly healthy words go to die. But etymological dictionary is that they're on life support, at least they're functioning to some degree. And here's the word. Of course, the word I'm thinking of is the verb to palliate. We don't really often use it as a verb anymore, but palliative as an adjective, you know it very well. Well, the root word of palliate is the P-A-L-L. -L. That's the root, Paul. Now, has this word ever shown up in your comings and goings? And the answer is, with not very frequent uh, appearance, yes, it does. What? What is a Paul after all? <laughs> There's a Paul bearer. So Paul bearers are carrying what? Dead. Yeah, but Paul is not a synonym for dead. It's not a synonym for body or corpse. There's an adjective called appalling. What does appalling in its old sense of the term actually mean? Appalling. No, no, that's what it means now. It means terrible and... Uh, and, and and not to be tolerated, but it's not, yeah, it's what it means now. But you know its root is the same word as Paul Bearer. And remember your famous Victorian prose, when a Paul fell over the city? Oh, so what's all that? Before I come to the word palliative. Yeah, no, it's, no, it's not actually. The root, it's a Latin word. Yeah, you're close, and some, I did hear some people mention it. A pall is a shroud or a cloak. That's its old, old meaning. Okay. So when a pall fell over the room, as happened about 25 minutes ago right here, <laughs> it, means, it means that you have this feeling of, ooh, something descended, man, and we're all under it, at least temporarily. And something that's appalling means it has the power to include you in that Enshroudment, if I can put it that way. Yeah. So how do we get from that old meaning? Now you understand what pallbearers are carrying. They're carrying a thing that covers or conceals what they're carrying. And that's what the word palliative actually means. To palliate means to cloak or to conceal. And in a death-phobic culture, that's what it has become. When I don't get a lot of ahas, I'm not sure if anybody's going, if anybody's going, what? Wow. Was there a wow? Okay, amen. Okay, well, so we'll meet later. We'll have a meeting, just the two of us, and we'll, we'll say, you know what I mean? And you'll say, yeah, exactly. No, what I'm suggesting to you is this. But I, I'm getting the hook already? Okay. I, I called out for you earlier, and you weren't here. I was, because look, look. Bookus, there's nothing there. No, this is not one of them, though. <laughs> so, okay, st just stay with me. This is a few more minutes you have to endure this. It's like dying. You know, it's not going to last long, so you can do it. <laughs> what I'm asking, that's the advice I gave uh, p parents, especially of young kids who are dying, all the time. They say, I can't do this another minute. I said, well, you couldn't do it another minute if you thought it was going to last a long time. That's true. So the, the crazy wisdom of this situation is, what do you wish for? In a, in a horrendous moment like that? And the answer should be, you wish for it not to continue. It's an impossible thing to want, but it's mandatory. 
Your refusal to want the dying to end is the death phobia showing up again and again and again. But your willingness for your loved one to die on schedule is your willingness for life to finally have its way with you and with all of us. Yeah? That's an amen. That's, that's the function of that. Say amen. Oh boy, okay. How do you wrap this up, son? Hmm. Okay, I could, I could propose this. I su suggested to you earlier that uh, one of the worst things you can do to dying people is put them at the center of the circus and ask them to decide what is best for them. How could it be otherwise? Here's how. The insistence on who's in charge, the insistence on choice, all of these things I'm asking you to consider are more of the same. It's rearranging the deck chairs, friends. When you decide that the principal dilemma is only to determine who's going to choose and who isn't, you've changed nothing. That's what I'm asking you to consider. I know this is not a welcome proposition, perhaps, in a conference like this. But we can entertain dangerous thoughts without being in danger. And perhaps this is a dangerous thought which threatens no one, but only asks us to consider it. So I would say it again, something like this. The idea that we're going to drive the entire end-of-life care bus by a driver called choice, all it does is try to change who's in charge. But it never questions the idea of being in charge in the first place. And that's the question that I'm raising with you now. How, what, how, could, it, how could it be otherwise? Everything has, comes down to who's in charge, doesn't it? Says who? Says competence addiction, that's who. So I'm submitting to you this. When you're dying, you are not in charge of your dying. It's too big. It's too mysterious. Okay? This is life having its way with you. You're not being ripped off. You're not being demeaned and diminished by the fact that your birthright as a person who was born is now coming to, coming to call and visit you. That's not what it means. But in a culture that's fundamentally death phobic, what is the meaning of your death? It's an intolerable intrusion into the natural order of things. That's what it becomes. And so it's inevitable then that the, quote, solution to this intrusion would be to reiterate the technological power that we have and just decide who's going to have their finger on the trigger. And that's what patient-centered care does. It just replaces whose finger is on the trigger, so to speak. And the alternative I'm imagining I've been trying to teach for years could run something like this. Who's at the center of the the care model, if it's not doctors, and it's not patients, and it's not families? And the answer is, it's death that's the center. It's death that's the teacher. It's the deep, abiding truths of dying that are to be served. <laughs> now it says two minutes remaining. <laughs> Suddenly, thank you. So imagine that then, that the real revolution that could happen in North America would be an end-of-life system, a healthcare system, in which end-of-life is not the end of health. It's not the annihilation of health. That you can be a healthy person dying. And that, in fact, you must be. That your health is not cancelled by your terminal diagnosis, but, in fact, your capacity to be healthy is now enhanced in a way that it never was before. Because your attention is now fully gathered to the project of being a deep human being. And that's what you have to leave to your heirs. Everything else, the moth will eat or the lawyers will take a piece of. But what you have to bestow upon the people who witness your death is how death might otherwise be. That's your bequest. And what I'm asking you to consider is this. You'll never be able to come to your death as if it were a gift you have to offer until you challenge the death phobia that says that the whole question comes down to who's in charge. Death's in charge. 
That's what life's in charge. Let life have its way with you. You didn't seem to mind when you were healthy. That's when life was having its way with you. Why do you suddenly decide now that life is pulling the plug on feeling good about you? you notice I'm using the word life, perhaps not God, or, but in some sense interchangeable. Yeah. Now look, I know and you know that you have nightmare stories galore awash in your mind right now with what I'm saying. You say, but I've seen all kinds of death and none of it good. And I submit to you, so you think you have. I mean, by virtue of my position, tons of it. And I still can stand here and ask us to consider what I'm saying. Why? Because I think that the, the intuitive instinct to fight the war against and so forth and so on, this is the thing that leads us towards the inevitable feeling of defeat. What do the eulogies say? or the, the death notices. After a long and courageous battle, what? You friggin' lost. That's what. That's what it should say. <laughs> yeah? So if you characterize it as a battle, you lose. But the beautiful thing about your death is that you're playing chess, and the best outcome you could possibly hope for is that you're checkmated by the ending of your own days. And then you can brag about what defeated you. See? And it's not a miserly uh, end to anything. It's something you can brag about. Say, I even died pretty good. <laughs> you know, I learned how to die well. And that's what everybody who's in the trade should ultimately be in the position of advocating learning how to die deeply and well as a human being. I'm supposed to end, but I'll tell you what. Oh, just one sec. I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm just in mid-flight here, so I'm going to stop for 15 minutes, and those of you who want to join me, we'll continue. And uh, thank you so much for your um, extraordinarily quiet and attentive uh, presence here because I have the feeling that it, it doesn't, it's not all, um, it's not all because you kept what I'm saying at arm's length that I could feel a lot of you willing to consider things. And so that certainly honors my long trip to get here. And as a foreigner, I thank you for your great hospitality and listening. <laughs>